All right, open on up to Revelation chapter 12. Re- Revelation chapter 12. Um, we have been in this series that we are calling A Wonder to Many. A Wonder to Many. And this is the last week of this series. If you've remembered for the last couple of weeks, what we've been talking about is there is a series upcoming next, starting next week that we're just going to be calling The Birds and the Bees. The Birds and the Bees. And so parents, I just want to lovingly encourage you. Kids, I want to encourage you. Uh, you are going to be back into elementary and preschool ministries starting next week. Um, We are going to have a lot of different things that we're going to say around this topic, and it is going to involve relationships, singleness, marriage, and everything in between. All right. And what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be trying to answer the questions that culture is continually putting before us. That's what we're going to do. And I'll just let you know right now, parents of maybe young middle schoolers or parents of young people in general, um, we're going to use the Bible to talk about this whole subject. And the Bible can be pretty in-depth at times. And so I just want to invite you to go ahead and explore those ministry spaces as you feel led as a parent. Amen? Yeah? Good. All right. Good. Um, But for this week, we are in our last week of A Wonder to Many. And today it's really simple. I want to show all of us today. I want us all to be drawn into this reality that we have an enemy. We have a real enemy. We have an enemy that is out to get us. The Bible says he's trying to steal and kill and destroy everything that God has blessed, everything that God has touched that is good. That includes us. But we can take heart because that enemy has been overcome. And so that is the sermon in a sentence today. Revelation chapter 12. Um, Here's what I know about the human experience. I think we are all captivated by stories of good versus evil. Aren't we? I mean, like I, I am not, let me just cards on the table right now. For those of you that are Marvel fans, you would classify. I, I like Marvel movies. I don't think I could call myself a Marvel fan. Any young people in the room? You like a good Marvel superhero movie? Anyone? Yeah? Okay. Like you can just pick up on certain taglines that sort of will ring in your soul for forever. Like I am Iron Man. Snap, right? Like you just love those moments. Luke, I am your father, right? Or if we go back to Princess Diaries, right? Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Come on, right? We all love a good story of good versus evil, don't we? Everyone like 30 and up is just celebrating right now. Everyone 30 and under is just like, what did he just say? I have no idea what's happening. Listen, what is a Princess Bride? Let's say Princess Diaries. Yeah, Princess Bride. My bad. Thank you, babe. I appreciate that. Um, we all, we're all captivated by these stories. Like, I, I think it's not just a way that we space out and that we numb, even though I think that is part of it. We try to like get disconnected or just try to collapse at the end of a long day by just putting something on the TV to be entertained. But I think more than that, I think our souls actually recognize that there is a real battle going on. No Thanos versus uh, the Avengers is not really happening. That's not actually unfolding. No, it's not these big stories that we like to, no, there's not some galaxy in a, like far, far away a long, long time ago. That's not what we're actually talking about. What we're drawn to when we're watching these stories is a very real part of the human experience where we go, this isn't the way things ought to be. Uh, this news headline, that thing going on, the brokenness we're experiencing in this relationship, the, the pain that I'm feeling here, the anxiety that I have about this issue, this isn't how it ought to be. Isn't that what we're feeling? Yeah. And I, I just want to implore you to consider time and time again, the Bible is trying to tell you that. The Bible is not trying to paint some human experience, the Christian human experience that says, man, just give your life to Jesus and all the problems go away. Nothing bad ever happens again. Is if you just put your faith in Jesus, then you don't have to worry ever again. Now the Bible has some real conversations that it's gonna press into us at times. And one of those that we find is in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, we'll pick it up in verse nine. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open that up. Kids, if you have your Bible, have your parents help you get to Revelation. It's the last book in your Bible. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening in the book of Revelation that we just flat out, we don't have time for this morning. But I wanna draw you into this one thought, that we have an enemy, and that enemy has been overcome. All right? Revelation chapter seven. This is right after we get this kind of prophetic image of Jesus coming into the world. So we know that whatever John's about to tell us right here, it has happened sometime after Jesus has come, but before he's come back again. Church, where do we stand in time right now? After Jesus has come and before he's returned again. So where where John is writing this to involves us today. So he says, now war arose 
in heaven. A war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels, they fought back. But he was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. Literally that phrase for thrown down, it's the phrase you could say bounced. Like he just was politely exited, right? Like you just, notice that God isn't fighting in this story. Michael's fighting. God's not. Eventually God just says, no more. And like an angry hornet, he just whacks him right out of the air. You're done. Get out of here. Where does he fall though? He falls down to the earth. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. If we skip down a few verses, it says in verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Rejoice, O heavens. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is no longer here in heaven. He has been cast down to earth. Rejoice about that. This is good news for heaven. That they don't have to, li- you, you read the book of Job, right? And you're like, why, why does this guy have, have airtime with God right now? He's just accusing Job over and over and over again. Well, no longer is it that way in heaven anymore. Satan, Satan, listen, Satan is not fake. He's not an imagination. He's also not in heaven. He's also not in hell. These are important things for the church to know. The devil is not just some greasy, oily, pig-looking thing. He's the enemy. In the Bible, what John describes him as is this dragon, this deceiver, the one who's trying to kill, steal, and destroy everything. He doesn't live up in heaven far away. He doesn't live down below in hell somewhere. He's on this earth. He's the prince of the power of this air that you and I breathe. He's been cast down though out of heaven. He says, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So the devil's down on earth and he angry. Uh, he's frustrated about it. Uh, the only way that I really know how to describe this is have you ever been tossed into a pool by your buddies? Anyone? Like we're gonna make light of this for just a second, even though it's not like that. Yeah. What's your only move? If you, like your buddies come walking up to you and you got that look on your face and you're standing right on the edge of the pool and you got like a few of them coming at you. Your only move at that point is what? Take as many of them down with you as you possibly can, right? It's just like, come on, you're coming with me. This is a picture of the devil right now. He's been defeated. God has already shown him where he's gonna go for forever. But in the meantime, he is madder than a hornet and he's trying to bring down as many people as he possibly can with him. And so the first thing that you have to know is in this life, we have an enemy. In this life, we, you and me, the church, the people of this world, we have an enemy. His name is Satan. His name is Lucifer. He's the father of lies, the accuser of the brethren, the devil, however you wanna call him, all one guy. He's trying to steal your soul away from King Jesus. Now we can't, he can't steal anything that doesn't belong to him. He doesn't have that kind of authority. The only authority the devil has right now is borrowed authority from King Jesus. But what he's gonna try and do is he's gonna try and harass you. He's gonna try to lie to you. He's gonna try and accuse you. He's gonna try and deceive you all in ways to get your eyes and your attention off of Jesus. But in this life, absolutely, we have an enemy. First Peter in chapter five, Peter writes this to us. He says, be sober-minded, think clearly. Don't pretend this issue doesn't exist. Don't pretend like this is just make-believe. It's just stuff of horror movies that you see on TV sometimes. No, he says, be, be clear in the way that you think about this. He is real. He's out there. In fact, he's so real. He says, be watchful, look out for him. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So the devil is there. He's out there. And he has three main schemes. There's probably more schemes that he has, but we're going to identify the big three this morning. The first is accusation. The devil loves to accuse you of all sorts of different kinds of things. Now, what does that, what does that mean? Does that mean that like you have some demon that shows up in your bed at night and he's going to start telling you things and you look at him and you're like, man, you look weird. Why are you talking to me? No, the devil's voice is going to sound a lot like your own voice in your head. You know, when you have those thoughts where you're like, man, I don't know. I don't know if I'm just the kind of person that can read my Bible every day. I just don't know if that's like, I'm just not cut out to be that kind of guy. That's the accuser speaking to you, saying that you're not the kind of person that can read your Bible. Only everyone can read your Bible. 
Uh, you, you may not understand everything. You, we, yes, I'm so thankful for the pulpit and for teaching and having good resources where we can help learn. But guess what? If you can learn things about your fantasy football league, you can learn the Bible, right? If you can, like whatever you do for work, some of you like build businesses, some of you fix cars, some of you are accountants and CPAs. All of that takes learning, doesn't it? God, like I, don't, I can't even wrap my mind around some of that stuff at all. And listen, you learn it. You can learn the Bible. Don't let the accuser convince you that you can't read the Bible. So the accuser, one of the ways that he's going to try to get you off track is he's going to try to get you, believe, get you to believe things like that you can't do things you ought to do. That's the first way he accuses you. I know I should be spending more time in prayer, but I just, I'm not that good of a prayer. Have you said that to yourself before? That's a lie from the pit of hell. You just start praying. God, I, I don't know what to say right now. That's a prayer. God, I'm really confused at why this thing is going on right now in my life. That's another prayer. God, would you help me understand more clearly what I can do here? That's a prayer. Do you see this? Like, I know when some people get praying, they have these eloquent prayers. Everything seems to rhyme, right? Sometimes I, I, I'm praying and some things just rhyme and I'm like, okay, Lord, I know you're in this right now because that just rhymed or that alliterated. <laughs> Praise God, you know? But man, can I say, like other times, don't you just pray and it just feels clunky and awkward and you're like, do I even speak English, you know? Like, is this my native tongue for real? Like, I, this just doesn't feel good right now. That's the accuser trying to get me to stop praying. I, I had this revelation yesterday during the fast. It took me all 20 days to get here, okay? I'm like, man, God just seems so attentive to me right now. Have you guys felt that way during this fast? You starve yourself of something, you go without social media, you start, you start putting away food that is distracting you a little bit or that you're, that you're, uh, that you're coping with. I, I'm putting these things aside. And I'm like, man, it just feels like God's right here listening to me. And you know what I realized? God's always right there. He's, he didn't actually move at all. It's me, I, I moved. I changed some of my practices of abiding and now I'm right here. The accuser would love to convince you that God's far off, that he can't hear you and that you're never gonna be consistent in doing the right thing. He'd also love to convince you that you're never going to stop doing the wrong thing. So that's the other thing he'd like to accuse you of. That whatever sin you're caught doing, the thing that you're trying to hide from everybody else in your life, the thing that you just can't seem to kick, the behavior that you don't want to do, but you keep coming back to it, that sin, Jesus has already set you free of that sin. There is freedom for those who are in Christ. He, is, it is for, he has set us free. Free. Do not submit yourself, therefore, again, to a yoke of slavery is what the word says. What that means is you have been set free of all the power that used to control you in the sin, in the bondage, in the snare that you were trapped in. God has set you free. You don't have to hold back into that stuff anymore. You don't have to lean into that behavior anymore. You might choose to, but God's already forgiven you for it. If you stumble, if you fall back, God's grace is there to meet you again. And you can't lie to yourself. You can't believe the accusation that you're stuck doing that forever because he's freed you from it. He set you free. It says in John 8, 44, the back half, it says he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. You hear that? There is no truth in him. You know what no truth sounds like? It sounds like half truth a lot of time. The devil would love to try to get you to believe things that are partly true, but have a little bit of lie mixed in with them. Isn't that the way that he tempted Jesus in the wilderness? He started throwing all these little half-truths together and Jesus says, hey, no, I'm gonna stand on scripture and on scripture alone, that's not true, right? So you have to understand the devil's gonna try to convince you that you can't be set free from the things that you're stuck doing right now and it's not true. It's an accusation, it's from the devil and it's not real. The third way that he's gonna try to accuse you is he's gonna try to accuse you. What did I say in my notes? Hold on that you won't amount to anything. The devil's gonna love to try to get in your ear and say, because of your past, because of your track record, because of that thing that you did in 12th grade that you haven't told anybody about yet, because of that thing that happened to you as a kid, because of who you are, the, the family structure that you grew up in, the social class that you grew up in, because of the way, the color of your skin, the way that you look, the way, the, how tall you are, whatever it is, you're gonna say, you're not gonna amount to anything. You're never gonna amount to this. Whatever the dream is that God's put in your heart, the devil's gonna love to try and say, nope, you can't do it. You've disqualified yourself. You've set yourself out of that promise. You, you've removed yourself from that blessing. And the devil's just gonna lob those accusations in your ear time and time and again, that you aren't gonna amount to anything. When what does God look at you and call you? Beloved son. 
beloved daughter. Whatever he calls you to, he's going to qualify you for. There's nothing that can erode that from you. Amen? So he loves to accuse. The other scheme that he has, the other scheme that he has is lying or deceit. He's going to try to deceive you into believing wrong things. So the devil's going to try to lace different theology to sound really appealing. Uh, we hear, we read in Timothy that we've all got these kind of itching ears, these tickling ears. We just, we love to hear things that sound good, that sound right in our own eye, in our own ears, right? And the devil's going to love to kind of just lob these things towards us. And we have that going all kinds of crazy right now. You get on TikTok to find some theologian on TikTok that's telling you about who Jesus is just a kind of way. And that's not what the word says. It says he's the way to eternal life. And so we have these like little things that get spun in where the devil's going to try to lie to you, to deceive you, to get you to believe wrongly about who God is. He's not just trying to get you to think wrongly. He's trying to get you to do the wrong thing. It says this in James 1.15, that desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. So what the devil is going to do is he's going to tempt you in somewhere where you maybe already have an iniquity in your heart. This ini- that word iniquity, it just means like, I have this bend. I have this desire that's bent off, off track of who God has called me to be. I have this desire. Maybe it's towards fleshly things. Maybe it's towards the way you think. I have this proclivity, this, this like tendency in me. And the devil is going to put these things in front of me that tempt me in a certain way. And when I give in to those things, I sin. And when I sin, that sin brings forth death. And so the devil's going to love to just place temptation after temptation into your life. Things that you already know aren't the right way, aren't the right thing to be doing, but he's going to just keep help, helping orchestrate things so that you see them in front of you. Because he's a deceiver and he's a liar. And he's promising you that that promotion or that that, that new relationship or that person, that is what's going to finally make you feel like a better person. And it's a lie. It's deceitfulness from the devil to try to get your worship and your attention off of King Jesus. The third way that he's going to lie is he's going to lie by trying to get you to fall in love with things other than God. Have you ever heard this before? The devil's not trying to get you in some like field at one o'clock in the morning on a full moon sacrificing cats, right? Like I think that if you've watched any horror movie, you think that's what the devil's all about right there is that kind of stuff. That's, no, the devil is just trying to get you to worship anything other than than Jesus. And you, the person standing in your bathroom mirror every morning when you wake up, that's the easiest person for him to start with. So you just think this whole life's about me. I just think that my wife is, she's really just here to serve me, my needs, that my husband is just here to meet my needs, to that all, I mean, you just go down the line. He is trying to get you to fall in love with anything other than King Jesus. And so he'll use Instagram. He'll use people. He'll use different kinds of political systems, if you will. He'll use whatever it takes to get your attention and your affection pulled off of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords because he's a deceiver. He's a liar. That's his second scheme. The third scheme is that the devil brings death. The devil brings death. We just read it right there in James 1.15 that once desire is full born, once it's conceived and it gives birth to sin, the sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. But ultimately, where the devil's heading and, and where any of us are heading without Jesus is this eternal condemnation where our souls are detached and removed from Jesus, where we're being judged for our lack of faith in him. And that's heavy and it's hard, isn't it? Even some of you right now are like, man, are you sure you should be talking about this on a celebration Sunday? I thought this was kind of like, you know, fun. But we can't stop at a half truth. We know what the devil's business is about. And so if we don't name it and call it out, then we're never going to be able to fight against it. And so the devil, he's an accuser, he's a liar, and he's trying to bring us all into ultimate death. But our enemy, the devil, He's been overcome by Jesus. So it says this in Revelation chapter 12, verse nine. It says, the great dragon who was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. If we go on to verse 10, it says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now 
the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come and the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. Who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him. How did they conquer him? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they love not their lives unto death. You wanna know the really good news about what the Bible says? In Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved from the accuser. You'll be saved from the deceiver of all people. You'll be saved from death itself. You'll be brought into life. John 10, 10, we didn't read the whole verse before. It says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. You want to know what Jesus is after? He's after your flourishing as a human being. He wants your worship for sure. Man, we talked about that last week, didn't we? I felt like we all got a little bit of a spiritual spanking last week in a good way, right? Man, Caden did a good job on that sermon, didn't he? Come on, but I I felt a little, I, I was like, okay, yes, Lord, I'm coming here with a ready praise today. You better believe it, you know? But all of that, all of that is to bring us into the fullness of life. The whole point of his sermon last week was driving towards this point that God desires worship because he wants intimacy with you and me. He wants a relationship that's close. He wants to bring you into this life that's flourishing and abundant. The deceiver is going to try to offer you those things, but he can only offer little shadow substances. He can't offer you the full thing. Only Jesus can offer you the full thing. It says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am not a way. I'm not a part of a direction that you go on your spiritual journey of life. No, I am the way to God. You want to be reconciled to God? You go through Jesus and through Jesus alone. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to know how you fight the accuser? By the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. That Jesus was slain on a cross, just like this one hanging up. And he had nails driven through his hands, through his feet, so that we could have reconciliation with God. That's just a big word that means I can have right relationship restored with God because he came and he took the sacrifice that I deserved. He paid the punishment for my sin up on that cross, even though he had no sin of his own that he took to that cross. And he bore that punishment so he could have relationship with you and with me. And now I get to go, man, I have confessed with my mouth. I believe in my heart that Jesus has been crucified and raised from the dead. I give him my life. And now in that, I know that he is my way to heaven. He is the only way that I get to go to heaven. So when Satan comes and he starts to accuse me and he starts to tell me these little jank lies that I am not gonna amount up to this thing, that I can't read my Bible, that I don't know how to pray. When he gives those accusations to me, I get to say, no, thank you very much. I am going to heaven because of the blood of the lamb. He is my way to heaven. When he starts to come and he starts to bring his deceit into my life, when he starts to put these crap Instagram videos. I'm sorry, I'm gonna say it just that strongly. But when he starts to say things like, oh, hey, you can just explore your own spirituality. I mean, man, if you've been hurt by the church, you wanna just wander astray a little bit, just find your own time, do your deconstruction thing. And I get to say, no, thank you. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. He, he's gonna, like this book that he's given, I forgot my Bible this morning. What a terrible morning to forget my Bible at home. He's given us this book. It says that in the beginning was the word and the word, word was with God and the word was God, that Jesus is the truth and he's given us the truth in his book. We can trust it. We can follow it. So that when there's all these lies, all this deceit coming in, we get to go back to something and double check it and see if it's really there. He's the way, the truth. And when Satan tries to bring forth death, when he tries to lay this judgment on my life for the sins that I've committed, and he tries to put me to death by my own sin, Jesus says this, for God so loved the world in John 3, 16, that whosoever would believe in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. That's the invitation, that there is no eternal final death for those who are in Christ, but we instead get to walk in life. Here's the line for you to take home with you though this morning. You choose who you agree with. You choose who you agree with. The voices are gonna come the temptation is going to be there. There's going to be different things that are going to try to lead you astray. The Bible says that wide is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life and few will find it. Do you know why it says that? Because a lot of people aren't going to choose to walk on that narrow road. 
oftentimes what we see is people who are just going to choose to pursue the job to its fullest, pursue just finding fulfillment in marriage, finding fulfillment in kids, all these things that can't bear the weight possibly of our eternal souls. And we're going to follow after and we're going to chase after these things rather than just turning and acknowledging and agreeing with the truth that's in scripture that Jesus is the only way. And the only way that I get Jesus to be savior of my life is if I make him Lord of my life. And I say, Jesus, here I am, all of me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to convict me of, whatever part of my heart is off, God, none of it's untouchable to you. I'm all yours, And when we follow after him, listen, you are going to empower the person that you agree with in your own life. So if you choose to agree with the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit is going to be more empowered inside of you. You're going to feel more of his faithfulness. You're going to feel more of the ability to overcome the sin in your life. But if you choose to agree with and you entertain the thoughts of the enemy, when he's bringing his accusation and he's bringing his deceitfulness, When you start to agree with those thoughts that are going on in your head, you're empowering him to have more power in your life than he deserves. And so you choose who you agree with, but that's not the only thing. It says there in Revelation 12, 11, we'll end with this one. They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. You wanna know how we're ending this series, A Wonder to Many? I'm just gonna tell you today, this is the only story of good versus evil that matters. This is the only story of good versus evil that matters. This is the one that's being waged right now for your very soul. And listen to me, we might get labeled as as a nuisance to some people in culture. We just might. Your friends might not like the fact that you love Jesus. You might get a little alienated from some people in your life. You might not be able to be as close with that person as you used to be. You might not get to do all the things that you want to do. There's probably going to be some discomfort and even some suffering for those who keep pressing on in Jesus' name. You just have to know that right now. You have to understand that like the days, if they're worthy to begin with, the days of being a cool Christian culturally are coming to a close. We have to boldly continue to live out our faith. Not like jerks, not like mean people. We don't have to take our Bible with us everywhere and just club people upside the head. That's not what I'm saying but we have to be able to walk a razor sharp line of grace and truth. We have to be willing to be loving and honest. We have to be willing to be kind, but we have to have a a no compromise value in our heart for what we believe and what we look for in the future, how we behave, how we act, how we think. We can't compromise. We have to live in this world, but we cannot be of this world. We belong to a different kingdom. And so, We will share this story at all costs. We will share this story at all costs. Did you notice the very last line of Revelation chapter 12 there? It said, and they loved not their lives even to death. Now, personally, I'm really grateful we're not at that point in American culture. Are you you all as well? I'm assuming. But I'll tell you this, the places that are at that point around the world, they're seeing the gospel come alive and explode in ways that we probably can't even imagine. You start, uh, do, you do it. Don't, don't, don't Google it right now, later. But look at what's happening to the church in Iran right now. Where people have to choose right now. Am I going to choose to stand up for Christ and be put to death? Or am I going to renounce my participation with Jesus and spare my own life? And people are, st- they're having dreams. They're having visions. People are coming to faith like crazy. And they, they are loving not their lives even to death. So yes, church. Yes, kids in this room. Following Jesus might be uncomfortable for us at some times. People might not think we're as cool because we think about things a little differently than the rest of the world, but it's okay. It's okay. Jesus has a better version of life than the world could ever offer to us. One that has intimacy with the Father where we know him and we know his voice. He he has us walking in a way that would actually be good for our bodies, be good for our minds, the ways that we think. And ultimately, he's the defeater of death himself. Because of his death, he put death back in the grave where it belongs. And Jesus says, hey, all who come to me, all who come to me, you're going to have everlasting, eternal, abundant life. That's the offer on the table. We're about to watch a couple people as they're going to jump in these baptism waters and declare that Jesus has forever changed their life. And it's going to be awesome. And here, when we do baptisms here, I just want to let you know, some of you are new. We like, hey, we We like to celebrate at baptism time. We like to get loud. We like to bang our hands together. We like to shout, yell, make a lot of noise because this is the 
This is the physical picture, the outworking picture of someone who's gone from death to life, who's someone who's gone from darkness to light. And so we cheer about that stuff. But I want to give you an invitation before we go to baptisms to respond. I, I don't know if there's some people in this room right now who are saying, man, I've just, maybe I've been a cultural Christian, but I haven't surrendered to him yet. Maybe there's some young people in this room. You're saying, I, I want to choose, who, I'm choosing who I'm agreeing with right now. I'm agreeing with Jesus. I want to be on his side of this thing. And I just want to give you a moment here to respond to maybe what the Holy Spirit's prompting in us. And so if we could all, would we just, can we bow our heads, close our eyes? Holy Spirit, would you come? Holy Spirit, would you come? If you're sitting in here right now and you're the person who's saying, no, 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 today is the day I give my life to Jesus. I want this full, everlasting, abundant life that you're talking about, God. I want you just right now to confess it in your own words. Just say, Jesus, I'm yours. I belong to you. I'm putting off my old way of life. I know that I've sinned. I know that I've done things poorly. I've, I've misbehaved. I've been wrong before God. But I'm putting my faith and my trust in your son, in you, Jesus, that you died, you were killed on a cross, you were resurrected, and now you're seated at the right hand of the Father, that I can have a relationship with you. You can empower me. I'm, I'm here, Lord. I'm yours. I belong to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.